What we need is a, de- a good definition, human understanding uh, of what is a weakness, and we have to add that to our vocabulary. The purpose yeah. is, you know, how can you possibly ask someone a non-IT business, okay, to implement the president's executive order on cybersecurity if you don't understand what they're trying to do? Welcome to the Reimagining Cyber Podcast, where we share short and to the point perspectives on the cyber landscape. It's all about engaging yet casual conversations on what organizations are doing to reimagine their cyber programs while ensuring their business objectives are top priority. With my co-host, Stan Wisseman, Head of Security Strategist, I'm Rob Borrego, Chief Security Strategist, and this is Reimagining Cyber. So Stan, who do we have joining us for this episode? Rob, our guest today is John Keane. John has more than 40 years of experience, both as an active duty officer and as a civil servant for the U.S. government. One of John's areas of focus has been to be an advocate for and an implementer of best practices associated with the full spectrum of software development that includes code quality, architectural correctness, DevSecOps, as well as security weaknesses and vulnerabilities. John has worked closely with the NSA, NIST, DHS, and many others to advocate for and advance the practice of software assurance within the U.S. federal government. He is more widely known in the software assurance community as the software angel of death. And John, it's great to have you with us today. Anything else you'd like to add about your extensive background for our listeners, perhaps an explanation of how you earned that designation of software angel of death? Uh, Great, Stan. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, my uh, involvement uh, in the business, uh, actually, believe it or not, goes back to when I was in uh, graduate school in uh, 1972. I am that old. Okay. My computer architecture instructor had worked on the development of the first British mainframe in Manchester, England in the late 1940s. And as I told someone uh, in a, uh, from Britain who was in a meeting with me of that, he looked at me and said, oh, my God, you mean he worked with Alan Turing? So using the analogy, I am uh, one uh, step removed from Alan Turing. Wow. So I go back that far. Um, when I came into the government this time, uh, back in the civil service in 2009, I was hired by a good personal friend of mine, the late Dr. Greg Guernsey, to implement a practice called software code quality checking which I have received several uh, notices on LinkedIn recently from people I've worked with is the way that they are implementing DevSecOps uh, because we were taking a look at uh, code quality as well as code security, as well as architectural soundness. So it's a practice that I discovered uh, has been around for quite some time, just under different names or uh, uh, never really formalized until recently. So uh, when I took over this job, I was required to go through and to take a look at a series of scans that were performed on the software. My team was essentially an IV and V team. At one point in time, I received an ATO package, ATO meaning authorization to operate. I took a look at this. There was a request for approval for this system to be implemented because it was secure. But at the same time, I received a package of SEQC scans from my team. And the scans were absolutely horrible. There was nothing that I had ever received prior to that was as bad as this particular application. So I wrote a note to the government project manager and I said, I think you should return the software to the vendor and tell the vendor to do it over and to do it right for a change. So about two days later, I walked into a big conference and a big uh, display where vendors were showing all of their wares uh, for the uh, military health system. And the program executive officer was talking to the contractor whose software I had written the offensive report on. And as I walked into the room at a loud voice so everyone could hear, he said, there he is, the software angel of death. (laughs) And thus the... (laughs) the, And 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 Dr. Dr. Greg Guernsey uh, went through and uh, liked it so much. He never called me by my name. I was always referred to as a software angel of death. So, so John, let's, let's talk about kind of um, these past, you know, 12 to 18 months or so. And, and one of the hot topics, obviously, has been centered around 
securing the software supply chain, right? And a lot of it's due primarily to, to the open source components and vulnerabilities that have been found out there and the impact that we've seen. So if, if you, you know, think about kind of your approach, you, you've, you've discussed this with us, at least in the past, and we've seen a lot of it you know, publicly, you have a strong emphasis on enforceable contract language, right? Around software assurance. You've been doing that for a long time. Love to hear from you, your perspective, though, on the importance of how to properly vet that security, right? That the software organizations are either using today in some cases, right, without have, having done so. But more importantly, that process of why they should be doing it ahead of time before actually procuring it and putting it into production. Great. Well, um, I was, I'm always surprised uh, by uh, what has been written about enforcing uh, things like software assurance and software security, but which for some reason goes uh, largely ignored. So I was at a breakfast recently with a fairly high level executive from the Defense Department. And the two of us agreed very quickly is, is that everything needed to implement the president's executive order uh, uh, within the Department of Defense has already been written and has already been in policy. So there is, in fact, a policy memorandum that was recently reinforced by the DOD CIO that says if you're using open source software, you must do a full software assurance assessment of the code before you put it into use. I can tell you that almost no one goes through and follows that or is even aware of that. But the reason why uh, I was so interested in it is that in the when OWASP, and I hope everyone understands what OWASP stands for, um, came up with the tool dependency check, they asked the National Security Agency to vet the tool for its usefulness. Well, NSA unfortunately could not because it required access to networks that NSA was prohibited from connecting to. So the fellow who was my friend, who was the head of the NSA Center for Assured Software, asked me to go through to assess the tool with my team, which we did. So we validated that the OWASP dependency check did in fact go through and find the vulnerabilities, which were related to the weaknesses that we had been discovering in the code. So we did the full software assurance scan of our libraries and found that not only did the tool work and tell us about vulnerabilities, but Fortify went through and identified multiple other security weaknesses, which had yet to be found as vulnerabilities. There were multiple technical weaknesses associated with the code, and there, were a, there was a lot of architectural unsoundness. So when I told a friend of mine recently that I found open source code to be architecturally unsound, technically weak, weak from a security perspective, and filled with security vulnerabilities, is that all I had to say? And his comment to me was, I was too polite. So what I did on a rather critical application that is still in use today to enable interoperability sharing of information between the Department of Defense and the Veterans Administration, I engaged with my team to train the developer of the software on how to use dependency check and how to go through and use all of the other tools to, to make their code right. But when I went back and took a look at some of their recent scans, I went back to them and using dependency check, they were able to go through and reduce the number of vulnerabilities from 600 to 16 in a matter of two months, which include refactoring the code. So what it proved was that if you use the tool correctly, a trained practitioner did, you can go through and get rid of a tremendous amount of flaws within your software. And so I've always been interested from it from a perspective, can it be done? And once it can be done, can it be written into contracting language? And in fact, in 2016, a uh, federal oversight group adopted and modified some contracting language that I had been working on with several other gentlemen and actually went public with it. And it was endorsed by two major corporations here in America. Let's, let's pull on that thread a little bit more, John, because as you know, if development doesn't have a requirement, they're not going to focus on it. When you're looking at defining security needs, um, when you're purchasing software or when you're using open source, because again, you were talking about the, the, the needs to ensure that the open source you're consuming and your development process is secure. 
um, it's, it's critical to understand what those security requirements are and helping ensure that you're putting the accountability in the right place. You know, is it really the consumer of that software that's responsible for that, or is it the one producing that software? So, you know, I, I've also been a big advocate for proper use of contract language um, when you're looking to ensure that the software you're acquiring does not add additional risk to your organization. Um, I was involved with the DHS acquisition security working group under Joe Jarzenbeck back at DHS Build Security End Project back in the late 2000s. And we produced some, some example contract language in that effort. But what are some of the things that you're seeing as far as um, updates? Because we, we've been trying to do this for a long time. You know, what, what are some of the new developments that can help ensure that the acquirers of software build in the right language they need to and possibly leverage some templates or things that are out there as opposed to trying to come up with it on their own whole cloth? Well, one of the requirements of the president's executive order was to come up with contracting language. And we have a lobbyist. And one of the things that when I was brought on board as a consultant, I mentioned to him this contracting language, which had been developed in 2016. And I sent it over to him and uh, he went through and has forwarded to certain high level people within the federal government and also within the congressional staffs. And all of the language was based on the fact of what my team, who were software developers, not cybersecurity professionals, said could be accomplished just by going through and complying with the, with the rules. So we wrote the rules. And for example, in 2016, one of the rules we said that you will go through and you will fully comply with the OWASP top 10 and either the MITRE or the NIST or SANS top 25. And for anything that which you do not comply, you have to fully justify. Now, we only said that because we were able to go through and to teach people who were making those mistakes of the little amount of time it actually took to write code correctly. It's not, we, SQL injection being a perfect example. Uh, How many of them I've seen over the years, and yet how many times we've had to go back to a developer and say, in 15 minutes, you could have done ABC and not have made the mistake. Right. So it's not just the contracting language, it's also going through and taking time out of your scanning activities and everything else you're doing to go through and to teach people. Uh, So the contracting language will probably uh, be written for the federal government and uh, possibly uh, my language will be uh, some of the input uh, to that. Uh, I also go through and uh, one of the big complaints that we have is our our, uh, software developers not trained. So one of the things like I've mentioned to you when we've seen multiple errors of the singular type I've had, I had my team go through and train people. It takes a little bit of time, a little bit of training. I've never asked anyone to do the impossible. And to show you how simple some of that is, my software Ivy and V team actually trained me how to use some of the tools. Very nice, very nice, good approach. You know, let me pivot the conversation a little bit to, um, to an area around just terminology. And terminology, unfortunately, act, you know, equates to confusion. In the cyber space as a whole for security, you know, it's, it's confusing enough, but let's just talk about it from the, the area you've emphasized and, and been an advocate for for a long time around software quality and software security as a whole. If you just take the term software security, just in general, right, it, it gets completely misunderstood. But I'd love to hear just, you know, your perspective on how can we actually do things in a manner that really makes it so much more simpler so much more consistent for people to understand. So there's not all this time lost in having to educate people on different terms and confuse them in the first place, right? So, it's, so I know you've been an advocate in that space. I'd love to hear more about how your approach. Okay, well, one of the things that, uh, a little bit of background, uh, during my less than illustrious career, I was a uh, part-time uh, instructor. In fact, I uh, taught that back at, uh, I was invited back at, to uh, the school that I graduated from to teach in the math department. And for those of you who are familiar with this, I did not go to a real college. Uh, My colleagues in the uh, Navy, uh, Marine Corps and Air Force contend I went to a trade school that you may have heard of called uh, West Point. Okay. 
<laughs> by, by, that's a mutual insult we have to each other. <laughs> but I also uh, taught uh, a variety of courses here in the Washington area, and I taught, uh, taught uh, grammar and uh, writing. So I get very upset when I see poorly worded definitions. So uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with the new ISO standard, uh, ISO 5055, okay, which uh, just was published recently and which was the subject of my presentation partially yesterday. And so I was asked by the people who hosted that to refer to that standard. And, so, and John, uh, the, the, the presentation was to who? Uh, uh, that was to CISC, okay. uh, the presentation to CISQ yesterday. Yesterday being uh, June 7th, uh, I was asked to go through to uh, produce evidence why uh, software quality is not different from software security. And I have done extensive work on that over the years. I went through and scanned that database and just punched in keywords like availability. And sure enough, up comes at the point of time, it was uh, 67 uh, security weaknesses that have an availability uh, characteristic associated with it. And the reason for doing that was to go through to produce evidence that it was if people focused on making a make writing code correctly to achieve a correct technical outcome, that there was a high likelihood that they would also achieve a positive security outcome. And so uh, when I was doing my research and uh, taking a look at all this, uh, these terminologies, if that is, in fact becomes the standard uh, by which people are supposed to, which people are supposed to apply in order to go through to meet uh, software quality and software security, software quality is defined within the standard, okay? And it is it could derive from an ISO, def, uh, ISO uh, uh, glossary, and it also meets John's standards of being plain text English and understandable. However, we found out that within the standard, which goes through and discusses software security, it never defined software security. It defined security, but not software. And that the definition that they have for security is, uh, well, it's somewhat acceptable, but it is rather lengthy. And so when I went out to the web to find the definitions of software security, I found multiple definitions that are out there, and most of them are very poorly worded. So I will be engaging with CISQ on another effort in which you, standard definitions and better definitions uh, will be my point of contribution to the development of a new standard. But I really don't like definitions that start out by saying software security is a specific concept. Because when you start out defining something as a concept, I have sat around the table watching people pout at each other over what is the meaning of a concept. And you never get at a resolution. So we need a definition, and I pointed out yesterday, of software security. For those of you who are familiar with the CWE, the Common Weakness Enumerations, they went through, they are engaged in going through and really cleaning and modern, uh, modernizing them. Uh, they have suffered from a lack of interest for the past couple of years. I spoke to the leader of that project for DHS, and they are making remarkable progress. And, and just, John, just to interrupt, just for our listeners, again, there, there is a distinction between vulnerabilities in software and yes. weaknesses, right? And I think that'd be worthwhile to, because again, that could be a point of confusion. Uh, the CWEs, to your point, you know, are, are leveraged by a lot of folks, our tool vendors, uh, practitioners. But, but again, when we're speaking to developers, sometimes it, it is confusing when we're throwing out these terms of vulnerability versus a weakness. And perhaps you could you know, help yeah. our listeners better understand the distinction. Well, once again, uh, ISO has a very, what I consider to be a reasonably good human understandable definition. In fact, it was highlighted at a, at a recent congressional hearing by one of the uh, uh, participants uh, testifying to Congress that she found the language that was used uh, specifically, she called out NIST, as being, quote, too scientific and not understandable. 
But a vulnerability, according to ISO, and I'm looking at the slide right now, a weakness of an asset or group of assets can, that can be exploited by one or more threats. So well, that was pretty good. Now, what I didn't like about the website, they went through and said a threat is something that can exploit a vulnerability. Hence, we have the notorious circular definition. A is defined by B, B is defined by A, and trying to unconfuse those. But in using weakness, and I had the discussion with the folks working on this uh, at MITRE, uh, is that there is no formal approved definition for weakness. And, uh, and uh, it shocks everyone, and they all do their research while they're talking to me on the phone and come back and say, you're right. So within the ISO standard, they has a definition of a weakness, which is uh, allegedly derived from um, MITRE's work, in which they go through a specific structure of program elements in the software source code, sometimes referred to as a software anti-pattern. Okay, so John stops right there. Says, what is an anti-pattern? And why did you include that word in the definition? And it says that the uh, the pattern anti-pattern inconsistent with good architectural or coding practices violates a software quality rule and can lead to operational across problems. Everyone I spoke to in MITRE denied responsibility for that definition. However, within the CWE website, which they did agree to, weaknesses are flaws, faults, bugs, or other errors in software or hardware implementation, code design, or architecture that if left unaddressed could result in systems, networks, or hardware being vulnerable to attack. Now listen to those words. Those are nice, clear words. Now someone might say, define flaw, faults, and bugs. But by and large, my friends from Midas have said, but the definition says, please don't, any, don't do anything stupid or you'll get into trouble. That's what the definition really says. So what we need is a, a good definition, human understanding uh, of what is a weakness. And we have to add that to our vocabulary. The purpose yeah. is, you know, how can you possibly ask someone, a non-IT business, okay, to implement the president's executive order on cybersecurity if you don't understand what they're trying to do, okay? And if you... If you we had a, uh, one study that I took a look at and testimony in front of Congress. A businessman said, I don't do IT. I provide physical supplies to the Department of Defense. <laughs> and when I read what you were trying to have me do, okay, there was a questionnaire that filled out. I could only address five of the 37 questions. I had no idea what the other 32 were talking about. So if you're asking people to support an idea of better cybersecurity and they're not IT pra practitioners, they're not IT professionals, we have to do something of cleaning up our terminology and also our acronyms as well. Right? And the F, once you deconflict that and you go through and get the definitions, people are impressed by how simple the concepts really are. Uh, Stan, I did a, uh, an analysis I haven't put in briefing slides yet for definition of vulnerability management, but I went back to my old days of where I was, the federal practice for IT service management for a company I used to work for. And if you change the word from vulnerability to problem, the definition of problem management and vulnerability management are almost identical. Interesting. So after all, isn't a vulnerability nothing more than a special type of problem? That's the, Stan, that's the reason why people in the government don't like me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, John. So listen, so first off, um, thank you on taking us back to when you began and, and more importantly, 50 years of the service you've given our industry, the push that you've given it as well. But also just we appreciate that the passion and energy is still there today if not even more so at times, as you're speaking today, we really do appreciate that. And I think your, your point of the need to understand who you need to actually explain things to and keep it very simple, clear, and concise is, is the core of obviously your message and has been a message of yours for many, many years. So we appreciate you coming on, sharing your journey, sharing your emphasis and the things that you really care about and hoping that you continue to make more changes in this regard. So thanks for your time today, John. 
Great, and and please uh, uh, eliminate anything in the in the audio in which I refer to my wife as being an Italian from Brooklyn, hence the ability to make an offer you can't refuse. She gets very upset when I say things like that. She knows a guy is what I'm hearing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank you, John. Appreciate it. Hey, Vince. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Reimagining Cyber Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you would like to have us cover a specific topic of interest, feel free to reach out to us and you can find out how in the show notes. And don't forget to subscribe. This podcast was brought to you by CyberRes, a micro-focused line of business, where our mission is to deliver cyber resilience by engaging people, process, and technology to protect, detect, and evolve.